To the uninquisitive minds, the Nazca Valley may not appear to be any different than that of any other vast expanse of flat, dry land. It is seldom graced by the treasure that is rainfall, and it is sheltered by the winds sweeping the coast and the hills. But to the imaginative intellects of the populations who dwelled here centuries ago, this plain was an open, massive canvas on which to pour their imagination, creativity, and spirituality, or simply to carve endless tracks, fulfilling a still mysterious function. Arguably the largest horizontal archaeological monument on the planet, it's certainly one of the most fascinating. Ancient aliens, hot air balloons, astronomical maps, and mythical creatures, what holds the key to the secret of the Nazca Lines? The Nazca Lines are a collection of hundreds of geoglyphs located about 400 kilometers south of Lima, Peru, which cover an area of about 450 square kilometers across the desert plains by the river Rio Grande de Nazca and the Pampas of Jumana. To clarify, a geoglyph is a large drawing or symbol carved onto the surface of the earth. The geoglyphs at Nazca can be divided into two categories. The first group is representational. These shapes depict, in a stylized way, a variety of living beings, and so they are called biomorphs. The enormous artists have captured with linear elegance the likeness of animals, birds, insects, plants, as well as humanoid and mythical creatures. Amongst the best-known ones that you may recognize is the monkey with its spiral tail, the condor as long as an Olympic stadium, the spider worthy of a superhero costume, the giant, which some insist may be an astronaut, or the hummingbird with its beak dipped into two parallel lines. The second category includes lines and abstract geometrical shapes of varying complexity. The lines are generally straight and extend as far as 12 kilometers, crossing dry riverbeds or jumping over hills without ever losing their direction. Some lines develop into patterns, mazes, spirals, or expand into geometrical figures, some up to 400 meters long. These figures were clearly of great relevance to its authors, the pre-Columbian civilization of the Nazcas. The evolution of this society can be divided into four phases, the proto, early, middle, and late phases. The geoglyphs are believed to have originated around the middle period, about 500 BC. Around that time, the Nazca civilization was composed of local chiefdoms and larger regional centers, which gravitated around Huachi, a site of pilgrimage by the coast. After the disappearance of the Nazca civilization, geoglyphs were not mentioned in any record until the year 1553. This is when Spanish conquistador Pedro Cieza de Leon made mention of trail markers in one of his chronicles, possibly referring to the lines. The illustrated canvas of the Rio Grande and the Pampas was brought to the world's attention only in 1926, thanks to Peruvian archaeologist Toribio Mea Ixepe. He first spotted the patterns while hiking on hills nearby and later observed them from a plane. His talk about the lines at a conference in 1939 inspired American historian Paul Cossack to investigate the geoglyphs on site. Cossack was the first to start a systematic survey of the area, later joined by archaeologists Richard P. Shadle and the legendary Lady of the Lines, Maria Reihe. Maria Reihe was a native of Dresden, Germany. Not fond of brown shirts, toothbrush mustaches, or appropriated sound symbols, she left the country in 1932 just in time. For the following years, Maria worked in Peru as a governess and teacher before becoming Cossack's assistant. Even after the historian left Peru in 1949, Rahi continued to dedicate her life to the study and the preservation of the lines and biomorphs, protecting them from intruders, the weather, and deposits of sand. In fact, she earned another nickname, the Lady of the Broom, as she personally swept meter by meter more than a thousand kilometers worth of geoglyphs. It was largely thanks to her that the Nazca Lines achieved worldwide fame and attracted scholars from around the world. The Lady of the Lines died on June 8, 1998. She lived by her beloved geoglyphs to the very last day, and it is said that she sometimes chased away intruders on a wheelchair. <laughs> 
Maria Kosok and many others have all published theories on the origins and the functions of the Nazca Lines. Most scholars agree that the bulk of the geoglyphs in the basin of the Rio Grande were etched sometime between 500 BC and 500 AD. This time bracket was estimated by Raihi based on carbon dating of wooden stakes, ceramic vessels, and other artifacts found on site. As we'll see later in more detail, the biomorphs are probably more ancient than the geometric patterns. The shapes found at the Pampa of Jamana, though, may be even older. These may have been left by the Paracas and Tapara cultures who predate the Nazca by about three centuries and who also left their marks in the nearby site of Palpa. So far, so good with the consensus. The wild and separate theorizing starts when we approach the other big questions. How did these ancient people draw the patterns? What was the function of the drawings? And did those artists receive any help from above? One of the first historians to study the site, Paul Cossack, jokingly noted that the lines looked like prehistoric landing fields. This was an unfortunate comment, which may have been picked up by Swiss author Eric von Deineken. In his book Chariots of the Gods of 1970, von Deineken suggests a direct alien involvement. His view is that an extraterrestrial craft may have been headed to Nazca to extract minerals. The aliens on board dispatched a landing probe which left a long line in the ground. The spectacle must have left the Nazcas in awe. It must have been a portent of the gods, of course. A portent which inspired them to draw more and more lines and then biomorphic shapes as an offering to the beings from above. A sequence of events which you may have noticed contradicts the actual chronology of the artwork. Remember, first it was the biomorphs, and then it was geometry. On a separate occasion, the Swiss best-selling writer also speculated that certain patterns may have been delineated landing fields for spaceships. No mention of whether there was duty free, though. The alien origin theory has recently been revived by Reverend Rash and Sean Malone in his publication, The Orion Lines Solving the Nazca Lines and the Secret to the Stars. Reverend Malone noted how the straight lines of the planes tend to converge into three main hubs. In his interpretation, these three points replicate the constellation Orion. Ergo, the Nazca Lines were designed and carved by an extraterrestrial force known as the Orion Group, a satanic force who takes over star system, sick, throughout the galaxy, if not the universe. Malone proceeds to provide proof that this group has placed Orion patterns at Nazca as well as other ancient and modern architectural sites. This pattern, by the way, consists of three dots placed along the same line, so... Well, let's just say it's not exactly unique, is it? But what matters is the function of these patterns. The group has placed them to ward off competing aliens from messing with planet Earth. Their objective, though, is not to protect us, rather to mark our world as a hunting ground for them so they can harvest adenochrome from our adrenal glands. All right then. And the Orion group harvests more than adrenochrome, apparently. When studying the pyramids of Giza, Reverend Malone speculated the following. When I looked up at the blueprints to the Great Pyramid, I immediately knew it was a water well and that they were water harvesting the Neil, sick again, River. They were processing H2O and ionizing it, creating H3O, also known as hydronium, to fuel their craft. To comment on these theories, the best we can do is to borrow from author Jason Colavito when reviewing the works of Von Daniken. The underlying message of Von Daniken's work has long been that non white peoples are incapable of achieving great things without help from an outside force. We can expand on this by saying that certain authors feel the need to treat mankind as the lazy kid sitting at the back of the room, only capable of copying homework from aliens. In 1977, author Jim Woodman did not buy into this notion. He believed that the Nazcas didn't need any design consultancy from Orion to do their job. Yet, he still thought that the only way to carve the Nazca lines was to direct work from above. Not from a spacecraft, but from a hot air balloon. To prove his point, he crafted a balloon using material and technology which would have been available to the Nazca people. He even organized a test flight with balloonist Julian Knott, which surprisingly actually started pretty well, but the contraption soon started losing altitude and the experiment risked ending in disaster. In the end, the two brave researchers had to bail out of their flying basket three meters above the grounds before hitting the pampas. American archaeologist Anthony Avini later dismissed the notion that Nazca 
Alaskas had gone airborne. The hills adjacent to the valley are more than enough of a vantage point. Great. So we have now established that the geoglyphs were drawn by human artists with their feet firmly on the ground. But how exactly? Paul Sokor and Maria Raihi demonstrated that the shapes were obtained by simply removing the top layer of reddish oxidized pebbles, revealing a clearer substratum of sand and dirt. The gravel was then placed along the cleared path, protecting them from exposure. Before this stage, Nazca artists prepared sketches on small square plots, roughly two meters for each side. The preliminary drawing was then broken down into smaller parts, each to be enlarged. The longer lines were carved on the ground using ropes stretched between poles. Circles were done by anchoring a length of rope to a rock or stake. More complex curves could be drawn by linking appropriate arcs. In August of 1982, Dr. Joe Nickel decided to put this theory to the test. The stage magician, private investigator, and research fellow for the Committee of Skeptical Inquiry sought to reproduce the 134-meter-long carving of the condor. Nickel enlisted a crew of absolute beginners to prove that anybody could accomplish the endeavor. He got help from his father, his cousins, and a 12-year-old nephew. Nickel and family drafted a small preparatory drawing, then plotted 165 key points in the figure in relation to a vertical axis running through the condor. They then painted a 134-meter-long vertical axis on an empty field and replicated the 165 points adjusted to scale. Next, they played a giant connect the dots by stretching lengths of twine from one point to the other. Finally, they used the stretched twine as a guide to draw the lines. The end result was incredible incredibly similar to the original Condor in Nazca, and it took barely two days of work to complete. No balloons were crashed in the process, and no adrenochrome was harvested. We have discussed who covered the valley of Nazca and etchings and how they did it, but we still need to understand with certainty why they did it. What was the purpose of the biomorphs, the geometric patterns, and the long lines disappearing into the horizon? There are several theories, none of which has been conclusively confirmed or disproven. In 1927, archaeologist Turabio Major Expert suggested that the more linear designs were caminos religiosos, which could be translated as religious paths or pilgrimage tracks, perhaps heading to the Nazca coastal hub of Coachi. His colleague Alan Sawyer expanded the religious concept to the biomorphs in 1975. According to him, individuals would walk atop the contours of the drawings, thus absorbing the nature or essence of the object. Paul Kosserkin's Maria Reiche also buy into the ritualistic function. The geoglyphs may have been ceremonial decorations to attract the benevolence of the gods. But the duo also proposed an alternative theory, according to which the Nazca Valley was a sort of enormous calendar used by the locals to mark key moments of the agricultural year. They found, for example, that certain lines converged towards the sunrise on the winter and summer solstices, and certain biomorphs may correspond to the shapes of constellations. For example, the monkey shared some similarities with the Big Dipper. In recent years, physicist Emilia Sparavigna used Google Maps and the software Stellarium to identify precise alignments between geoglyphs and celestial objects. She found, for instance, that the long bill of the frigate bird points to the star Formalhaut, as it would have appeared in the skies over the year 1000 AD, or that the beak of the hummingbird dips into two perfectly parallel lines. As the scientist puts it, the direction of these lines corresponds to the direction of the sunrise on the December solstice. This means that the hummingbird is drinking the light of sun. These theories have been counter-argued by authors Helene Silverman and Donald Prohl. Their point is that any alignment between a star and a ground marking is statistically insignificant considering the huge number of stars visible in the night sky at Nazca. This astronomical debate has continued well into the 2010s. Since the mid-1980s, though, another line of thought has also emerged. Archaeologist Anthony Avini has found that most of the radial lines emanating from the Nazca plain ended in trapezoidal shapes, 400 meters long and 40 meters wide on average. These shapes are typically oriented along watercourses, with the narrow ends pointing upstream. This led him to speculate that the lines were related to water in some important way, either functional or ritualistic. Avini also suggested that the straight lines could be merely narrow footpaths, as they present many similarities with those developed by the Incas centuries later. 
These footpaths may have been used by the alias or kin-related groups to reach their place of work. According to the later developed Mitter system, Andean societies required alias to move across the region and spend pre-assigned time working far from home. Maybe these paths are a trace of a pre-existing similar labor system, allowing commuters from centuries ago to find their bearings. Johann Reinhardt, writing for National Geographic, has expanded on the water theme. This region may receive only about 20 minutes of rain per year, therefore water is clearly vital. His idea is that the lines were meant to lead pilgrims to places where rituals were performed to obtain water and fertility of crops. So what about the biomorphs? According to Reinhardt, the end purpose was the same. Most of the depicted animals were associated with the concepts of water, abundance of crops, and fertility. This indicates that they may have been propitiatory symbols carved to petition the grace of rainfall from the gods. I should stress again that no definitive explanation has been agreed upon yet. The exploration, analysis, and interpretation of the geoglyphs is as popular as ever in recent years. In June of 2019, a trio of Japanese researchers concluded that many of the bird biomorphs have been misidentified. The famous hummingbird, for example, is now considered to be a hermit. Close enough, they belong to the same genus, but hermits are not local to the Nazca Pampas. The trio have also spotted a pelican hailing from the coast. Their conclusion is that Nazca artists came across these birds while traveling, and when choosing subjects for their drawings, they went for the exotic option. In November of 2019, another Japanese research team from Yamagata University discovered an impressive 143 new drawings on the Nazca Pampa and the surrounding area. 142 of them were identified through fieldwork and analysis of high-resolution 3D data. The 143rd was discovered by developing an artificial intelligence model on a server configured with the deep learning platform IBM Watson. The Yamagata research offers new interpretation as to the nature of the geoglyphs. The oldest shapes, dubbed Type B, date to the initial Nazca period, between 100 BC and 100 AD. They are between 5 and 10 meters in length and form solid colored surfaces. Type A geoglyphs are over 100 meters long and were created in the early Nazca period, 100 to 300 AD. The team concluded that Type A figures delimited ritual places. Here, inhabitants of the valley performed ceremonies involving the destruction of pottery vessels, while Type Bs, usually found on sloping inclines, may have been used as wayposts for travelers or to demarcate territories. In a way, they indicated that a certain area belonged to a certain social group. From May to November 2020, Peruvian archaeologist Johnny Isla has identified further Type B shapes with the help of a drone. The new geoglyphs are located in both the Nazca and Papa Valleys and appear to belong to an earlier tradition. The latest find is the internet's best friend, a 37-meter-long cat resting on the side of a hill. Not all new finds are on the fluffy side. Before revealing the cat, Professor Isla spotted a 65-meter-long biomorph with terrifying features. It appears to be an orca, but it has a human arm and it holds a severed head. More heads appear to have been ingested by the creature. The orca is located some 50 kilometers north of the UNESCO site, and Isla believes it to belong to a transitional stage between the culture that carved the type Bs and the later Nazca tradition. So we started today's episode by referring to the Nazca plain as an enormous canvas. If there's something we've learned from the existing studies, it's that it could also be compared to a giant book, a book of conflicting stories in which each chapter hints at a different solution, wildly pointing to opposite directions. Recent technology such as drones or AI has helped us read plot twists previously hidden between the lines. But we are far from flicking to the last page where the mystery is revealed. So I really hope you found this video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to subscribe. And as always, thank you for watching.